is with hard work and a bad philosophy, it still equals bankruptcy, frustration, starting over. It means a lot of times in the entrepreneurial world, getting on a treadmill and just running faster, but not getting further ahead. So instead of talking about sacrifice and scrimping and budgeting, we're gonna look at a different way to do this of injecting cash into your life right now. In 2006, I remember we were, it was January and we're sitting there accounting for everything that was going on in our life. And I had started in the financial business in 1998 and we're just like counting our blessings, feeling so good about everything. All the hard work was starting to pay off. And then everything changed June 9th. June 9th, I got a phone call on my home line. I don't even know my home line. My wife still says we have to have a home line because maybe every other cell phone melts down and our kids are gonna need us at that one specific moment, right? I don't even know if they know how to use that home phone, you know, or know what the number would be. But at the same time, I'm getting these calls in the morning and I'm just not, li I'm like not answering because I'm just confused as to what the noise even is. <laughs> like, what is that? So I finally pick it up and it's one of my business partners. His name's Mike and he says, hey, the company plane left St. George, Utah last night with our other partners, Ray and Les on it, and no one's heard from them. Now, I'm an optimist, so I was thinking, well, maybe they just went to Vegas. That's not far from, from St. George. Maybe they just took a detour. But once I turned on the news, I had been confirmed that the plane had crashed into Utah Lake. And see, these guys were 35 years old at the time, right? So for the next four months, all I did was work. And I worked as hard as I possibly could. And I just, I came from a coal mining family, so I knew how to work hard. But at the same time, a lot of my life was starting to slip away. I gained 22 pounds during that time. I didn't even see, I had a one-year-old son that was born in 2005. I rarely saw him because he was usually asleep by the time I left. And by the time I got back, he was already back to sleep. And I remember being so exhausted trying to like keep everything together and make it happen and do whatever it took to honor their legacy at the sacrifice of my own. See, one of my partners, Les, a month before he died, he pulled me aside after this retreat and he said, you know what, I can't imagine life being any better. I love my life. I love my life. And so at this point, I wasn't really loving my life anymore I'm just exhausted, and then we're going for Thanksgiving to this little town of Price, Utah, which is a two-hour southeast drive from Salt Lake City where I live, and we're going to go visit my family, and it's like the first break I've had. And on that drive, we're going through the canyon, which my wife and I have our best conversations in the beautiful mountains, you know, driving in the car, and it starts out pretty awesome. She's telling me I was an extraordinary businessman. I liked hearing it, not going to lie, you know? She told me I was an extraordinary radio show host, and she used the word extraordinary several times until she looked back at my son in the back seat of our Bentley, which shows and demonstrates all the wealth, but not really how we were really feeling at the time, and looks back at me and says, but you're just an ordinary husband and father. And I, actually, I got pretty emotional instead of getting defensive because she was right. See, and that kind of thought of sacrifice is what is ingrained in a lot of us when we are taught that hard work will get us there. The problem is with hard work and a bad philosophy, it still equals bankruptcy, frustration, starting over. It means a lot of times in the entrepreneurial world, getting on a treadmill and just running faster but not getting further ahead. So instead of talking about sacrifice and scrimping and budgeting, we're gonna look at a different way to do this of injecting cash into your life right now. Does that sound all right? Things that you could put on the ground in the next, let's say 48 hours, because you probably have to get home, that will actually boost your bottom line without having to give anything up. As a matter of fact, why don't we make a deal? Part of what we bring to you and give you this insight, you take some of it and you actually put it into your life to improve it because you're your greatest asset. Not a stock, not a bond, not a piece of real estate, but you. So as we get this money, let's have you invest it back into yourself, not just into your business, although you can take and put a lot of it back into your business, but into experiences and memories. Because I remember when I first started in business, 
I was with my dad and we're driving, he had one of those 1984 Chrysler New Yorkers. Anyone remember that car? Anyone even, you know, for those that were born back in those days, it was one that was so technologically advanced that when you open the door, it would tell you the door is ajar. Now I was a kid, I didn't know what the hell that meant. I'm like, no, it's a door, not a jar, but whatever. It's super cool that there's a robot voice coming from the car, you know? And we're driving down Main Street and, he, and I'm telling him at the time, because I'm just starting, I'm like, I'm gonna work harder than anyone else is willing to work so I could live a life in the future that no one else can live. And I thought that sounded so amazing and impressive. My dad said to me, he says, guess what? You can never get back the memories that you never have. It's like, okay. So yeah, we're gonna be talking about money and finance here, but I wanna set up the stage that there's really three mindsets around this. The first mindset is playing not to lose. And I, I got really good at playing not to lose growing up in a small coal mining town because I was on the basketball team where we were ahead at halftime 18 times that year, yet at the end of the season, we won three games. That's a professional level of playing not to lose, right? And playing not to lose in the world of finance looks like scarcity, it looks like fear, doubt, and worry, it looks like budgeting and constraint and reduction and elimination, and no one shrinks their way to wealth. I'm, I, I don't know why I'm yelling, I didn't mean to yell. I'm just really excited right now. So no one's done anything wrong that I know of. I'm just passionate, right? So playing not to lose also looks like a term you've probably heard over and over in the financial world, diversification. Diversification for most businesses is diversification. It's actually premature diversification. If you take good money out of your business and put it into plans that are locked away, that you don't know, that you don't understand, that you don't have an exit strategy for, you don't know why it would go up or down, you're just told, invest early, often, and always. This is born of a playing not to lose mindset because you're no longer investing in yourself and fitting that we're here in Orlando because one of the best statements I ever heard on this was written by Roy Disney, Walt's brother. He actually wrote a letter to his parents where he said, you know what? I think a lot of people are gonna learn some hard lessons in the stock market, and this was just before the Great Depression. He said, what we're gonna do is just invest in what we know and put it in this little TV studio that we're launching, or this little studio that we're launching, and look what happened. That's more investing in yourself rather than investing in a bunch of companies that you don't know much about, that you haven't even heard of, you've never been to their boardroom, being in the name of diversification, and waiting for 30 years, by the way. 30 years, who's excited to finally live and enjoy life 30 years from now, right? Can we just question the whole notion of retirement for just a minute and maybe just retire the concept of retirement and enjoy life along the way, not waiting for one day someday, then, oh, well, I'm finally gonna travel when I have to go get a new hip, you know? Not as cool, not as fun. Or if the whole way there, you're in the playing not to lose, scarcity and scrimping mentality, do you finally get there one day and you flip the switch and go, I'm no longer a miserable miser, I'm now an abundant spender, <laughs> you know? Like, that doesn't happen. So it becomes an epidemic, a disease of the mind where people adopt the consumer condition. The consumer condition is a place where people take more value from the world than they give to it. And it is, it is a disease of the mind that destroys wealth. Nothing will destroy wealth more than scarcity. Scarcity, I don't care how much luck, saving, discipline, rate of return, business scale ideas, or anything, if you're in scarcity, you will find a way to make a good thing bad. And you agree, he just gave me an absolutely like amen from the front, I, I wish I had something to give you. Like, thanks, <laughs> I love it. You know. Just so you know, I'm not Jesus. I'm... <laughs> so, there's this different mindset, and by the way, this other mindset's a lot sneakier because I don't feel like people that are in the playing not to lose show up to these types of things. The sneakier mindset is the playing to win mindset. The playing to win is something that we put on the cover of magazines. The playing to win is the very thing that had Ryan get so sick at 30 years old because he was just working so hard. It's the same thing that I had when I was like, okay, my partners are die they're dead. What am I gonna do to keep this all alive? I'm gonna do my radio show every single day. I'm gonna do whatever it takes. And whatever it takes is the mantra, but this is the question. At what cost? 
At what cost? Playing to win is where risk is rewarded. It's where volatility lives. It's where cash crunches are continually invited in on a regular basis. It's where people lose their health, lose their family, lose their life because of playing to win because sometimes we have the wrong definition of success that comes from society rather than from ourselves. So two questions. Number one, are you playing a game worth winning? And number two, is the juice worth the squeeze? Like if I showed up and said, you can work harder and make more money, who's really excited about that advice or who wants to punch me in the throat, you know? I mean, do you think someone becomes a billionaire just because they put in more time than you or they work harder? It's about doing the right hard work. Yeah, hard work's part of the equation, but the wrong hard work actually leads to exhaustion. It leads to difficulty. It leads to you know, feeling guilty when you're doing one thing because you're not having any time for another. And there's something in playing to win that almost inevitably happens, and it's the thing I experienced trying to preserve my partner's legacy, which by the, by the way, you know the answer to helping their legacy? Was to live and define my own. They would have never wanted me to give up my life and not spending time with my family in the name of you know, building up theirs. The reality was after my wife said that to me, said I was an ordinary husband and father, within six days, I gave one of the divisions of our business to the existing employees and said, if you want it, it's yours. I'm gonna start working from home. I'm not gonna answer every email. Who just feels like life got really good with email? Like, oh my God, I just want more email. Because then, like in school, we were you know, like, I would feel more popular with more email. No, I mean, so I, I decided not to answer every email. I decided not to pick up every phone call. I decided to spend some time with my family. And what happened was I was re-energized because in the playing to win methodology, I had this mindset that created diminishing marginal productivity. Diminishing marginal productivity is you're there more often, you're working harder, and you're getting less done. Just before we left for Thanksgiving, I remember my assistant walking up to me and saying, hey, you're double booked, what do you wanna do? And I was like, double booked, oh my God, like, what are we gonna do? Oh, double booked. I was so exhausted, I couldn't even think what to do to double book. Now, right now, I could say, well, let's find out if someone's running late. Is there someone else in the firm that can handle? We could call and reschedule. I could think of a thousand things because I'm not so damn exhausted right now, right? So playing to win is a dangerous dogma because here's the deal. The people that we see playing to win, like what's been going on with Elon Musk lately? Not sleeping, right? Absolutely, like, does, does it sound like quality of life? Does it sound like, but yet we put these guys as our icons, and a lot of times they have a massive destruction along their wake of people that they care about and things that start to destroy their life. So the good news is I have a third. I'm not just going to go, okay, there we go. Defense, boom. No, I have a solution. And the more you laugh, the more it encourages me to say these types of things, just, just so you know. Um, <laughs> the third category is to win, then play. What do I mean by win, then play? Well, let's dissect four or five win, then play examples and then give you a practical framework to do it in your life. Here's one example. France gave the United States the Statue of Liberty. Really nice of them to do that. It's pretty cool. The problem is they didn't give them a visitor center or they didn't erect it into the water like we just had this big statue. So who's gonna pay for that? We did something brilliant in New York at that time. In the magazines and in all the newspapers and all the stuff they had back then, they said, hey, anyone that donates six cents, six, you can be the first to come to the visitor center because you're gonna be the people that actually build the concrete you know, with your money the concrete for this to be erected on and for the visitor center to exist. And so they had all of the money. And by the way, all the people ready to come and see the Statue of Liberty. I have a buddy named Yannick Silver. Um, if anyone know Yannick, like Yannick, uh, so if you, one person clap for Yannick, um, I'll, I'll have to let him know that he needs to write more books. Um, but he was the first 100 people to put money in Virgin Galactic. 
right? So that he can go up into space. So all of a sudden he's already put the money in and then he's gonna get a ride on it, but they've actually got the money from people who are participating, not from disconnected investors, not from venture capitalists that only care about the return. And if you don't get the return, it doesn't matter the impact, they might squash your business. Win and play is you don't have to spend a single penny, you can build the momentum. So we can look at the Super Bowl. We don't even know who's gonna be in the Super Bowl, but guess what, the NFL already won. They've already sold all the tickets. They've already sold all the experiences. They've already, you know, got paid by Atlanta. Like, they've already got all this money before the game's even played. Win and play is really cool, by the way. I get a little excited about it because it revolutionized my life. Like, when I wrote Killing Sacred Cows, I decided, well, I don't know if enough people will buy the book. I had like 6,600 people in my database at the time. I made this naive kind of notion that I want to be a New York Times bestseller, not knowing what that meant. And so what I decided to do is while I was writing the book, I started to pre-sell the book and I pre-sold 22,000 copies by giving people these old things called DVDs. Yeah, I, I once tried to give a DVD at an event a few years ago and a millennial was like, what is that? <laughs> and they also didn't have a DVD player. So the next day I brought one of mine that we no longer use and I could relate to them now, right? But I, I created a DVD, I created a teleseminar course, and all of a sudden I was giving them all this value up front, so 22,000 copies were pre-sold before the book even came out. Win, then play, right? And by the way, Ask is so beautiful for it, because another thing that I did is I wanted to do a video series back in 2008, but I, I didn't have a TV studio yet. And I didn't know if people wanted a video series, I just knew I wanted to film one, and sometimes that would really suck if you just filmed one and you're the only one that wants it. So I just went out to everyone on my list and I said, hey, if I were to do a video series, A, would you be interested? And B, if I were to give it to you for half the price of everyone else so that you can give me feedback as I'm building it, how would that look? How it looked was we got $150,000 up front, built the TV studio, had the whole crew, and I still walked away with $20,000 at the end of it. And I knew it was filming it for actual people, not just to sit on my hard drive at that time or whatever, right? Win then play. Want to continue the path to be a better investor? Make sure that you're not losing money and taking too much risk? Well, click here and learn about strengths vesting.